Okay, so this next thing we're going to move on to is estimation. And so this is the Klein chapter six, and it really talks about how do these models get created and a lot about the math behind the models. So estimation, the way I think about it, is the math that goes on behind the scenes, what the computer does, to give you those parameter numbers. So we talked about variances um, on, on the latents or on the uh, exogenous variables, the paths going into endogenous variables, error variances on endogenous variables. And so really, this is like, how do I get the numbers out of the, um, out of the program? So there are a couple of common types. We're mostly going to use maximum likelihood, um, but there's also asymptotically distribution free, um, weighted least squares, two stage least squares, and then Levon, the program we're going to use, uh, our package we're going to use with R, has a bunch of other types of options, mostly in the least squares family. Okay. Now least squares is the same type of math that a regular regression uses. Okay. Sometimes it's just called, uh, yeah, just least squares. But I'm mostly talk about maximum likelihood because that's more common, especially when you think about EFA, the most common type of math is maximum likelihood. Um, so what it does is it takes the a bunch of estimates and it maximizes the likelihood, hence the name, that the data is drawn from the population, okay, is the theoretical definition of maximum likelihood. And that seems really abstract because this is the idea that this is the estimate that is most likely to be from the population or the null in the case of sim models. So remember with a model that you're building, you're trying to build a picture of what the population actually looks like. And so maximum likelihood's purpose is to pick the best estimates that match that population. But in theory, you don't actually know what the population looks like, so it's a little abstract. And it's considered a normal theory method. Okay, so that means that I'm assuming multivariate normality uh, which means that's why we started this semester with data screening because you have to check for normality of your variables. So you really got to check for assumptions. Um, and if you have non-normal dependent variables or those endogenous variables, other types of estimators are going to work better for you. Um, you just have left power with non-normal variables using maximum likelihood. It's often called a full information method, which means that all of the estimates, so all the parameters, the variances, the means, the intercepts, anything you're calculating is all calculated at the same time. Uh, partial information methods calculate part of the estimates and then calculate the rest. But maximum likelihood works by calculating everything at once. So a full information method. And it does this by calculating a fit function. So it's trying to minimize that fit function. And what that means is we're calculating chi-square um, and we want the smallest chi-square possible because that's a calculation of the error. So the fit function is the relationship between the real covariance of the data and the estimated covariance from the model. So remember we talked in the last section about how SIM is a analysis of covariance, uh, but if that's confusing to you, think about correlations. That's just the standardized bit. Okay. So it takes the, the, the covariance of the data and the estimated covariance from the model and tries to minimize the distance between those two. Okay. So our fit function leads us to fit indices, which is in one of the next sections. And we want the fit function to be a high number if we're measuring how much they match. So we want our covariance and our, our, our real covariance table and our reproduced covariance table to match. So the correlation between them to be very high. Those are goodness of fit statistics and those often end in any kind of index. So you'll see lots of, um, when we get to fit indices, uh, ones that end in an I, those often are ones that should be high numbers, like closer to one. But generally with fit functions, we're talking about values we want to be very low. So how much they mismatch, those are residual statistics. So I'm going to take my co sample, my real data, my model, and I'm going to subtract them. And I want that to be a really small number um, because that's my error. Um, and those are statistics that I usually have an R in the front, like rim C, so root mean square error of approximation, or SRMR, standardized root mean residual, not to be confused with RMSR, 
root mean root rm root mean square of the residuals that sneaky s goes strange places sometimes but they're approximately the same idea okay so the way maximum likelihood works is it's an iterative process so it's going to pick a start and run several times to create a distribution of possible estimates and pick the one that maximizes the likelihood of it being from the population which therefore minimizes the likelihood uh, the fit, fit function okay. those start statistics are generally calculated by the computer but you do have control of them if you want and generally we just let the computer handle it however maximum likelihood is not perfect none of these uh, maths are uh, it will often create you an, uh, not often, um, sometimes it'll create you an inadmissible solution. And what that means is that you will get numbers in the output that are clearly a hot mess. So the, the biggest clue for this is sometimes called a Haywood case, which I think I have on the next couple slides. If you see a negative variance, any type of variance, not covariance, variance, so your errors, um, they can't be negative, they're squared or your standard errors for one particular estimate are extremely large generally standard errors standard errors and maximum likelihood are very small like 0. 0.0 something small um, or they're at least in the scale of the data so if you have standard errors that are in the range of 1 1 1 1.5 1 1.2 and one of them is 37 that's a good clue that something's wrong so standard errors should not be very large uh, remembering that it does scale to the data sometimes um, but generally if you have one that's sort of outside the range of normal ones then um, it's a good clue something's wrong I have no idea what she's barking at all right let's keep going see if we can manage to keep away from the dog <laughs> all right particular there are things called Haywood cases so Haywood cases are, um, we'll talk about these a lot this semester, are when the parameter estimates are totally illogical, so extremely huge when they shouldn't be. Um, negative error variance estimates, so I'm just talking about variances, not covariances. So any double-headed arrow between two latents or even between two errors, or I don't think you can do it between squares, but you might be able to. Um, those are correlations, so they can get negative, um, but variances cannot be negative. Uh, and it will warn you in the output from Levon, it'll say, ooh, this isn't good. Um, so just be sure you look for it. Or any correlation over one, so a square of multiple correlation or just the regular correlation estimate in a standardized solution cannot go over one. So what happens when you're using maximum likelihood and you get one of these? It could be a specification problem. It could be the way you've drawn your model. It could be non-identification. So you have used too many degrees of freedom. Generally those models won't run, but you can have problems with identification at the, the structural component where the measurement model doesn't and they might run. Outliers in the data can cause you problems. Outliers don't tend to be quite as problematic in, in SIM as they do in a regular regression because there are lots of slopes and there's sort of a lot of stuff going on um, and generally there are so many people in the data set because you're trying to do a structural model that they just impact the data less but always try it with and without outliers to determine if they're the reason for the problem okay. small samples are very problematic you will get more um, Haywood or inadmissible, inadmissible solutions bleh, with small samples um, Anytime you have a latent variable, so circle, right, with only two indicators, you should never have a latent variable with only one indicator because then you've essentially just had a square that you were pretending to make a bubble. So all latent uh, variables need to have at least two indicators, but really two is not quite enough. You always need more. Okay. Um, bad start values, especially for the error terms. So sometimes what we'll see, and we'll see this this semester, is that you'll get negative variances because it just doesn't know what to do with the question. And so you can tell it to start with the standard deviation of the, or standard error, of the real question to help it find a good solution for you. 
And then the biggest problem, personally, is a very high correlation. Um, so this is empirical under-identification or just a problem of, um, uh, blah, 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 what's the word, um, a singular matrix where the, the problem isn't within the data, so all of the squares are, are different enough that you didn't get a singular matrix problem, but the latent variables are so highly correlated that it can't determine the difference between the two. Okay, so that the this last one is one of the biggest issues that you'll have small samples as well uh, but generally with identification the computer won't just like they won't let you program it that way okay. so another thing about maximum likelihood in particular is it's considered a scale free or invariant type of met fitting estimation or sometimes called extraction and what that means that is if I linearly transform the data so let's say I realized halfway through, and this has happened to us before, where uh, we downloaded our data from Qualtrics and it scored everything from one to seven, which is pretty normal. That's what, how it picks the scoring because that's a normal set of scoring for a Likert scale. But you went back and you looked at your scale and you realized, oh, this was supposed to be scored zero to six, or you know, it could be negative two to two, it could be totally different. Um, you can take that set of items and literally, literally transform, so hard to say, you can take them all and mathematically subtract or add or multiply those columns and still get the same answer. And so that's nice because if you realize you misscored them all, it's not going to change your solution. It's just going to um, move the, the numbers around. Okay. The, um, the solutions should still be the same. Okay. However, it does assume that you have unstandardized start variables. Um, and so if you're entering a correlation matrix or your start variables are z-scored, you should um, be sure that you don't look at a standardized solution. You only look at the unstandardized solution and remember that you've already standardized it. Okay. So if your data is already standardized, look at the unstandardized solution to be the standardized solution because it's already standardized. That's a lot of standardized in one sentence, but essentially if the data should be unstandardized to start, if you can help it. Okay. Now, how do I interpret these outputs that I'm going to be looking at soon? Okay. And really what you want to do is look at the loadings or the path coefficients. So this is the line from a, a, um, any variable, but maybe a latent to its um, measured variables. And that's just a regression coefficient. So as the latent score, um, or as the person indicates higher numbers on the scale score, the latent score is also getting larger. Because remember the latent is actually X. So as those people in, you know, um, say something higher, you're getting higher scores, right? If the, the path coefficient is positive. So the latent is X predicting Y. So as the latent goes up, the scores on the uh, scale go up, um, which is a little weird to think about since you don't have physical scores for the latent, but it's that idea of like, as my IQ increases, I should score higher on this test. Remember IQ is just a really simple way to think about it. Um, error variances tell you how much variance is not accounted for in the model. So this is all the variance that's left over. I don't know what to do with it. You want them to be small. So the reverse of the error variance is the square multiple correlation. And that tells you how much variance is accounted for in the model. Okay. So error variances we want to be small because those are things like, um, we don't know, um, path coefficients are just like interpreting regression coefficients. And then I don't have this on here apparently, but um, Interpreting a double-headed arrow is, is just like a correlation if you're looking at a standardized solution. So you will say as one goes up, the other goes up, but you're not predicting a direction. Now some other methods of estimation. If you have a continuous variable with a normal distribution, you can use generalized least squares, unweighted least squares, or fully weighted least squares. So I see a common theme here is least squares estimation. 
Um, which one's most popular? Probably unweighted least squares. So with unweighted least squares, the pro is that it doesn't actually require a positive definite matrix. What does that mean again? Remember that means that the matrix um, has to be invertible, it can't be singular, each um, column has to mean, has to be a separate thing. So essentially it doesn't require that your um, columns be perfectly unique. Um, and sometimes with very high correlated data, that's something that you have, a problem that you have. And it does create you robust initial estimates. Okay, robust meaning that they're pretty, uh, they're likely to be the same over and over again. The cons of unweighted least squares is that it's not a scale free. Okay? Um, so if you transform the data, you will get a different solution. It is not quite as efficient as my maximum likelihood and all of your variables should be in the same scale. So if you have age and income, you gotta fix one of them. Generalized least squares, the pros of that one is that it is scale free, so you can transform the solution, and it is faster computing wise. Um, generally, I, I, this is personal experience with cons here. It's not commonly used, I don't feel, and if it, because if it runs, usually so does maximum likelihood. And P, maximum likelihood is most definitely by far um, the most popular version. So what do you do if you have non-normal data? Well, in maximum likelihood, the estimates might be accurate, but the standard errors will be very large, which is bad. Okay. Uh, and it tends to overestimate model fit. So it tends to look like a good model when really maybe it isn't, which isn't good for you. So what you can do is use the corrected normal method. That's maximum likelihood with an adjustment to the standard error. And you'll see this being called robust standard error sometimes. And so it takes maximum likelihood and just tweaks it a little bit for non-normal data. Okay. And this is the Saratora Bentler statistic. Satora, I'm probably butchering this poor person's name, but it's that particular statistic is pretty popular. It adjusts the chi-square um, for the degree of kurtosis, and I'm fairly sure this is the default in Levon. So it'll let you um, correct your chi-square with a fit statistic um, based on that degree of non-normality. Okay, so it is a corrected model statistic. And the thing about the, that, that is that that model statistic is what is used to calculate many of the other fit indices that we'll get into in a couple of videos. Another method is asymptotically distribution free, or if you're reading the Klein book, he calls it arbitrary distribution free. I've seen both, depends on the program you're looking at. And it estimates the skew and the kurtosis in the data to generate your model. It may or may not converge. Um, it has more trouble converging. Oops. Um, and I have always found that this is a hot mess. It has never worked very well for me. Um, and if it runs, usually maximum likelihood runs, and I get much more stable estimates of standard error. And so I just wanted to let you know it's, it's a thing that sometimes people do, but I've never had it work very well for me. And then what do I do with non-continuous data? Well, I hate to tell you to use a program that costs money, but Mplus is a great program. I've used, I've used it as well. Um, but you can do some estimating with non-continuous data, but it, M plus definitely has the background research and the community which has has worked on having robust and automatic estimators for categorical data. And depending on what kind of thing you're trying to do, you might even be better switching to maybe an item response type of model. Um, it just kind of depends on what your purpose is. If you're looking at mimic data or uh, multi-group data, you're uh, using that categorical predictor as maybe an IV that's fine with maximum likelihood. But if you're trying to predict a categorical DV, those endogenous variables, um, you might be better off switching to a different analysis or a different program um, because M plus handles that much better at, this, at the particular moment. So all that together is just different ways of um, thinking about fitting or estimation. Um, and then in the next section, we're gonna talk about path models so beginning to build your first model, and then also fit indices, how to interpret the models that you're building.